Thank you so much for attending to my talk. Um, today I'll be talking about an uh, important topic that has been um, around, at least in, in the community, uh, during this year, that is sustainability um, and how OSPOS uh, can become or are becoming a key lever of, for open source sustainability. But before dipping dive into the topic, um, since this is OSPCon uh, brought to you by Chudu Group, I, I would like to share some OSPO news and announcements first. I, I'll be really, really quick. And then we will get into ways organizations are right now addressing open source sustainability, the role of OSPOs in supporting open source sustainability. And uh, at the end of the talk, I'd like to share some of the community learnings that has been uh, serving in this community and if we have time for Q&A and open discussions on this topic. Uh, so Nithya was already mentioning that, uh, but every year we do uh, the open source program office and the status of OSPOS. And this year we are launching the 20. Uh, 23 edition uh, in partnership with these great organizations and open source communities. Uh, so thank you, thank you so much. Um, so the service already live. If you go to tutorgroup.org and in the blog section, you will see an article that people can uh, click on it and take the survey uh, and feel free to share it with other organizations uh, that are working on open source initiatives or OSPOs. Um, we are working, so the Tudor the group has been uh, hosting a repo, a public repo uh, that has the an OSPO definition uh, since 2020, as far as I know. And uh, we are making a uh, new release uh, updating that definition because uh, Nisha was also mentioning like OSPOS has evolved so much across the, uh, during the past year that the definition might need to be now like uh, uh, to be updated uh, to be more inclusive and according to the reality that we are facing right now. So this is a call for contributors because uh, everyone is welcome to participate in this community and to contribute to the different projects and initiatives that is going on. Uh, so if you're interested, there is also another blog article uh, where you can find more information on how to share uh, your input and your experience uh, to help to define the new OSPO definition. Um, we are starting an ambassador program in Tudu, and that is really, really exciting. It's something that uh, the Tudu Steering Committee, uh, together uh, with the broader community, has been working on. Um, and we are right now open to a call for ambassadors. So if you are participating in the community um, and engaging in OSPOS or are an OSPO practitioner, feel free to uh, take a look to the guidelines and uh, requirements and responsibilities of uh, to become an ambassador of the Twitter group and uh, OSPO ambassador. And last but not least, this year uh, a group of uh, open source folks uh, from different organizations, foundations, open source communities uh, kick off a, a new working group and, and a new initiative in, in, in OSPOlogy, that is the uh, broader community. Uh, that is called, that, that is a book project. So, uh, Chidu has been doing a great job on gathering guidelines and knowledge and so on, but there are outside and even within the Chidu group and outside, you know, the OSPO communities, great sources. So, what we are trying to achieve here is to build a body of knowledge that gathers all the different perspectives and all the different work that all the communities has been doing. And uh, I think we are like right now 30 contributors actively engaging in conversations and, and contributing to, to the content of this book. And it's a work in progress. So if you would like to join, also all the documentation in the link. And um, you have there a QR, a QR that links to the Slack channel of the, of the group. So if you are not 
part of the Slack channel, I really welcome you to, to join. Uh, we have different working areas, so we have the working groups that are the people behind the to-do guides, working on the to-do guides or the OSPA book project, uh, like doing more like um, the share knowledge um, stuff. We also have local groups, like um, we have the uh, Japanese uh, OSPA community uh, group. We have also like a Netherlands group in Europe. We do also have uh, one in Switzerland. So these are local communities that usually they feel comfortable talking in their uh, native speaking language. Most of them, like for instance, the one in Switzerland is happening in French, in the Netherlands is in Dutch, in, J in Japan is in Japanese, uh, that gathers together to talk about a specific issues and problems and came up with search solutions for OSPOs in that specific country or area or region. So we do also have um, these local groups. And finally, we also have network and discussions groups. So this is not more, this is sometimes it uh, mix it with working groups. Like in those discussion groups, sometimes there, we, we, there, there is a new working group that raises, like there is a specific need. Uh, and then uh, the people put gathers together to create a working group to, to work like for instance, so this is what happened with the outbound open source guide uh, from the to the European chapter. They decided to, okay, uh, this is a need. Um, and in my organization, we have this kind of policies and guidelines. And in other organizations, they have different ones. So why not collaborating together? Why not open this to the public and share it so everyone can uh, find inspiration on how different organizations that had an OSPO did. Um, and, and, and this is one of the outputs that came from, from those discussions, which, which I think is great. And sometimes there are not outputs. Sometimes it's just, I really want to hang out with peers and, and share um, my experiences and learn from others, which is also great. So as I said, feel free to scan the QR if you would like to, to join the group. And there are other, um, other resources out there. So we have an open source program office 101 course. That course is completely free. It's uh, in one of the to do GitHub repos and has different modules on uh, the basic of an OSPO. So if you would like to get started in OSPO, that can be a good place to at least start. And you can also continue with, um, in Tutor Group, we have the tutor guides on different topics uh, on how to get started with the OSPO and continue the OSPO. And uh, one of the latest works we did uh, was the business value of the OSPO. Um, to try to analyze and explore why organizations uh, were creating, sustaining, and also expanding the open source program offices. That is one of the books out there. So saying that, let's now come back to the topic. Um, and to start with, I would like to uh, talk about a specific question that was raised yesterday during the OSPOCon summit. So OSPO, um, not OSPOCon, sorry, ChaosCon summit. So Chaos is another LF project focusing on uh, community uh, analytics health and analyzing the health of the open source communities and the uh, open source projects. And um, we got a really insightful conversation on what does sustainability means uh, to you? And also, is it different or similar to health? And um, all this came up with the question on, okay, it, it looks like many organizations knows or understands the value of why taking care of open source because they are using open source. Uh, but there might be some organizations that they just stuck into that step and doesn't take care of the contributions. So even though 
open sources everywhere and uh, there was a statement that said that uh, the world is built on, to on software and open source is eating some software or something like that. I, and I know like many organizations actually understand that. The next step is, okay, um, and what about contributing to open source projects? Because that might be maybe the next questions to ask. Like does open source contribution scale on the same level as open source usage? Like on, I know organizations care about open source because they are using open source, but do they care about contributing to open source? And that's why the reason of why I submitted this talk and wanted to, to talk with you and to discuss with you the open source sustainability and how OSPOS can help. So to start with, let's uh, start deep and dive more into what sustainability means uh, and addressing open source sustainability. So um, when looking in the, on the internet, on Wikipedia, on, on, on other different sources, there are different ways to define sustainability, but I found a, a really interesting graph um, that was more related with uh, more like environmental um, stuff, but that I think that can be also applied into open source. So they define it to sustain a, sustainability with three pillars that sustain <laughs> the sustainability concept, oh my god. Yeah, so um, they, 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 they put like environmental pillar, economic pillar, and social pillar. So when I look at that, I was like, hmm, that, it's really similar to open source. And let me get that straight. So when I hear environment, I can also understand open source projects. When I see social, I see open source community. And when I see economic, I see goals and business. Um, so more like for the organization, is it making impact for the organization? And maybe, uh, and this is just my perception, um, maybe we can take these uh, three pillars and uh, think about how can we um, improve each of those areas to actually uh, talk about and addressing open source sustainability. Because uh, in, in my honest opinion, I think like the economic goal uh, for organizations is pretty clear, right? Like, okay, I know we are using open source and uh, I know like open source can help in my business. I don't know how, that's why I maybe I might, might um, hire the OSPO, but I know like, or I want to uh, see profit and, and, and help my goals to succeed. Uh, but sometimes they just don't forget about the environmental part, like the, like, okay, and how are my open source, how are the open source projects I engage with operating and evolving and engaging? And what about the open source community? Because that is also part of what makes something sustainable. Um, so right now organizations are doing different um, activities, different initiatives, uh, even though they have an OSPO or not, to try to help on addressing sustainability. Uh, the most direct thought that you might think of is funding, providing funding. Uh, there has been great initiative, some examples, uh, Spotify Foss Fund released last year. Um, the Indeed OSPO in the past, uh, led by Dwayne O'Brien, also did uh, the first contributor fund that was inspiration for many other organizations, including, for instance, the Spotify Fast Funds. Uh, and uh, they also have a book uh, that serves more details on uh, why creating the Fast Funds and the details on how to implementing in that organization. Um, Bloomberg's Alisa is here uh, as well. Uh, recently released the Bloomberg's, uh, the, the OSPO team released the Bloomberg's first contributor fund uh, a few months ago, or I think this month is when, when that happened. And there are also other initiatives outside the organizations, like for instance, GitHub sponsors uh, that, uh, as far as I know, other organizations go with OSPOs are um, using uh, to, with the aim to provide funding to uh, maintainers, independent projects, and um, 
the open source projects that needs it. Uh, also, I wanted to do a shout out to uh, the maintainer month that is happening this month. Um, now that we were talking about uh, funding and how organizations can help. Um, also, there are other ways. So, for instance, providing contributions and infrastructure that uh, usually people think on, yeah, funding, uh, if I am an organization, funding it's the direct way to do it, but you can also teach uh, employees uh, on how to contribute to open source uh, and also to provide infrastructure to those open source projects that your organization is engaging with. Uh, this comes from the last SOSPO survey that was, I, I thought it was really interesting, that says that 65% of, of organizations that contribute upstream open source formally structure the OSPO. And I think that it's really interesting because we will say it in a while, but OSPO usually is just a way to, is the vehicle to streamline open source operations. It doesn't, it's not that if you don't have an OSPO, you don't care about open source, but it can help to put order into chaos. A third um, thing that organizations are also doing is adopting open source best practices. It's not just about, yeah, let's contribute. Sometimes employees within organization um, doesn't know how to contribute to open source, or maybe they need some legal advice and also operational and, and, and how to operate within open source dynamics and specific tooling and automation processes to make their lives much easier. So uh, organizations are helping with that, putting policies and processes uh, to ease that contribution and to understand the open source culture. Um, so I think it's also really, really important to not just say you need to contribute, but contribute in a way that doesn't harm the open source ecosystem, that benefits both the organization, but also uh, the open source projects and the ecosystem itself. So talking about when, when we see all these different uh, ways organizations can help and address open source sustainability, uh, here is a, the, the uh, typical problem we face. So the open source ecosystem, it's really wide thing. And uh, there are different actors, open source actors outside the organization. So we have maintainers, we have independent projects, umbrella projects that are part of foundations. Uh, we have also contributors uh, we, and, and so on. So it's, it's open source player is really different and they have their different ways to operate and different communications channels you can get in contact with those people. So what we, do we do? What can an organization do? And OSPO can help on that. So the OSPO can be this uh, entity or group of people, because OSPO is behind the OSPO, there are people that put order puts yeah put all the chaos into order yeah and and cleans up all the mess uh, so i think that it's also really important and can commu uh, connect all the os those open source players with the organization and vice versa and get the feedback from the open source community and share with the organization so that their needs and their questions and their concerns and problems get also heard in the organization. So now that we're talking about open source program offices uh, as a way that might help uh, addressing this uh, open source sustainability, I think it's important to understand uh, uh, the OSPO and what an OSPO is. But before that, some important consideration. So we, here we are talking about OSPOS and looks like, yeah, this is it. This is the, the final definition and everyone should do it this way. It's not. In, in Twitter group, we always said, your OSPO is not my OSPO. So they might vary in sector, in region, uh, the organizational side. Um, and there are, there are OSPOs that they don't call it an OSPO, they call it open source offer, office or open source strategy center. And it's 
I mean, it's the same. Um, even though the world is different, the goal is going to be uh, the same to manage open source operations and a strategy. We saw, well, in, in Nithya and past Nithya presentation, we uh, already saw like what is an OSPO as an entity. So I'm not going to deep dive into that. In today's talk, I wanted to um, go uh, to see a different perspective and is who is in the OSPO. Like, what is the people, what kind of people are behind in an OSPO, either virtual or physical, either uh, is not officially formed, but at some point they're operating like that. Because mm. I think it's important to also address like what the people behind the OSPO can do in your organization. So we have the enabler. Um, so these are about, uh, and when organization decides to put strategy and uh, streamline this open source operation, it needs education. Yeah, it needs a person or a group of people to work on uh, how to establish processes to help to operate in open source and, and uh, include wor uh, workflows and also adopt new tools and technologies that is these contributions. We also have the controller and uh, that is uh, related to uh, the metrics of experts I was uh, later uh, sharing in the Q&A session. Uh, so it's more about how these people can solve the problems on the different teams. So it's about providing guidance and advice on what are the latest open source trends, what happened with this project and, this, uh, and their licenses. So like, is it safe for me to contribute to that? Is it not? So they actually act as, as these um, people, as this guide uh, to help organizations uh, uh, to advance in the open source journey. They are also advocates and I'm seeing more DevRel. So I came from DevRel background, by the way, it's there as well. So um, I, I've seen more and more open source DevRels that they work within the OSPO because that is also a really important task within the OSPO to uh, promote the usage and also to encourage the developers and also non-developers, depending on the organization, to uh, engage in open source projects and also understand their needs. Like, okay, why, why so these people wanted to contribute to open source or motivate them? And, and give them um, these motivations to engage in open source projects. Um, and also, and I, I like a lot this, this last role, uh, will be the environmentalist. So addressing uh, security issues, also uh, maintenance, uh, taking care of the maintenance of the open source projects, understanding how well these open sources are maintained, the health of those open source projects that can um, give us some um, ideas on the sustain and how these open source projects are sustainable and so on. So uh, this is all about establishing policies and procedures for core review, security vulnerability checks, um, ongoing maintenance, uh, and so on. And, and maybe also like some analysis on what open source projects uh, to fund and what are the best ways to, to provide that funding to those open source projects and maintainers that need it. So okay, um, we've been talking a lot about OSPOs, uh, but actually where do open source and OSPOs converge? Uh, and, and that is, I, I ask this question because sometimes it's difficult uh, for organizations to actually understand. Because um, even when the organization realizes that they, they need to do something with open source, uh, they might be not ready to start an OSPO. And that's totally fine. I think it's more important to start asking previous questions first and know what is the status of your open source within the organization. And once you know all that, 
you might think of, okay, let's put a, a, um, a team or a dedicated group of people to work on that, uh, to, to work on, 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 on open source. Because uh, organizations might have, uh, in a, might be on different stages in their OSPO, in the open source journey, and that is gonna also uh, be the starting point on how to start the OSPO and how the OSPO should be structured. Does it, w will it be lending to engineering, to marketing, or to legal? Which, uh, that also is gonna um, uh, let you understand where should be the OSPO and how should be the OSPO be structured. Uh, so here are some assessment guidelines um, that in the, for instance, in the OSPO book we were discussing a lot that can help you to, to get us started. So first, evaluate the culture with your organization. So is, this a, is the organization ready to open source operations? There are, like for instance, the, techno, the big tech companies might say, yes, I mean, we have been using open source forever. My employees knows how to operate in open source. Uh, and, but maybe there are, for instance, in, in Europe, uh, I've seen more and more organizations getting into open source while there doesn't have enough um, tools and culture to start with open source. So maybe that might be the, the starting point to, to ask, like, okay, is there a culture of collaboration and sharing in the first place in my organization? Is it too traditional or is it actually um, getting ready to, to uh, operate in open source? Um, I wanted to do also a thought out to, in case you want to dive more into this topic of the inner source commons communities that actually works on that. It's a community to work on um, open source culture within the organizations, not going fully open source, but to start to, to think about the, how to implement this culture within their organizations and the different teams. So they have the inner source patterns, which are a set of guidelines to, to get us started, and you can go to their page to, to learn more about. Um, the other question is about knowledge and understanding. So does my organization understand open source? And what about on the different teams? Um, also, the how, how what is the level of open source usage? Like uh, Nithya was, for instance, saying, well, in, uh, in Amazon, in between 80 and 90% of the code we're, uh, we develop has open source components. Uh, so, well, it, I think it's important and also in your organization, try to understand that. Like, what is the level of usage and what open source products do you rely on, do you depend on? Um, and tools and processes. So, are there processes in place to, fa to ease these contributions? Because you might be motivating your developers and non-developers a lot on, yes, you need to contribute to open source, and this is, how, this is how open source can help you in your career and your whatever. But if there, are, if, if there are, there's a lot of procedures in your organizations and bureaucracy, uh, maybe you kill that contributions. Even though uh, peop, uh, there are persons that really want to contribute to open source, they cannot do that in the organizations, that is not good. So how can, and in the OSP, how can these people ease uh, employees to contribute to open source? Uh, so in a nutshell, it's about addressing the gap. So to adopt open source and to advance in the open source journey, what is this needed? And what uh, problems does my organization have and what solutions can I provide? What support can this OSP do to, into the different teams of the organizations that engage in open source? Uh, and also, even though you think that an OSP might be a tedious thing to implement, and probably during the first months, years, you might not see like direct output impact in the organization. In the long term, it's gonna thrive. Um, and I, I think this graph is really uh, serves that. Like when organizations start to just put 
patches into, okay, we got an open source vulnerability, we got a vulnerability from an open source project, how can we fix it? Okay, it's, it's fix it. Okay, yeah, let's forget about open source. That's, that's cool. Um, you might not scale, but if you start to think about uh, including a strategy around open source and taking care of the open source operations with a team or a group of people or a matrix of experts, um, there might be, in the long term, see the value of, of investing in that. And we have been talking about like how, how an OSPO or how organizations can engage in open source, but sometimes that, som that som sometimes uh, we forget about the anti-patterns that organizations might start when they hear the word OSPO and even like today, for instance, this year, that I see a lot of organizations saying, let's start an OSPO because um, everyone is doing that, so why won't we do that? And I think it's important for those organizations that are thinking about starting an OSPO or are already starting an OSPO to look at the anti-patterns. Uh, things that an OSPO shouldn't be doing uh, because it's, it will harm the open source ecosystem and it might cause the organizations to don't want to uh, continue the OSPO program. So for instance, there are some examples like establishing an OSPO without proper alignment within organizational goals. You, the OSPO shouldn't be acting as silo. The OSPO should be talking with the different teams, understand their needs, understand the problems and try to say, well, how as an OSPO can solve the problems of those, of those of, for instance, the, the, the business team um, through open source. Um, also treating an OSPO as a legal or compliance function only. So that is great. Risk mitigation is important. But it's not the only thing. And if, we can, if OSPOs get stuck in that, uh, they are missing the important part of innovation on, well, open source um, is not just about taking care of, if I'm using open source, uh, how can mitigate risk? It's about, I need to, con uh, like how the organizations can contribute to that, to help also their businesses and also their goals uh, and help the different teams to treat. And also uh, believing that the OSPO gives solution in the long term. So this is a, a long term commitment. This is an investment that might that will take forever, or at least that is the the, the point of, of everything. So open source is here to stay. So an OSPO will be here to stay as well. And the same way, not handling correcting open source harms the open source environment is the same as if you don't hand correctly the OSPO. So to end up with, I'm gonna check if I, we are already on time. Okay, yeah, we're still having time. Uh, I also wanted to share a set of community learn learnings and best practices uh, that has been shared in the Twitter community in the shape of discussions, community discussions, and also in the uh, OSPO discussions in the GitHub repo happening and so on. So the first uh, is assess open source readiness uh, when starting the OSPO. Asking these questions can be a good starting point. For instance, like what does open source mean for the organization? And is there an open source culture within the organization in the first place? Um, and what are the key legal and compliance considerations of using open source software within the organization? Once you have addressed open source readiness, you might also want to think about assess OSPO readiness. Okay, so an OSPO at the beginning is an investment, like you need to put money in that. So what are the challenges and opportunities of implementing an OSPO within the organization? And uh, what resources and support will be needed to implement that OSPO? And that is really important because that is what you, if, for instance, you are the OSPO leader or an organization hires you as an open source uh, leader in the organization, you need to 
uh, know these questions really well, the answers to these questions really well, to transmit uh, and communicate what resources do you need and why and, and the support uh, that will be needed to grow the OSPO in the first months or years. Um, also, focus on shared knowledge. Uh, the, as I mentioned earlier, the OSPO shouldn't act as a silo, uh, but it's something, it's, it's a, an ally, a supporter that um, communicates and engages into the different teams. So, for instance, the OSPO should, or the people behind the OSPO should be communicating with the executives and the, uh, and the um, stakeholders and understand like, okay, how can I provide value? And where are their needs? What does my supervision expect, expects? Also, if you have a team behind, uh, like uh, below, so what's my team doing? Um, and also, there might be other teams, like for instance, uh, if your OSPO is in engineering, um, and you need to communicate with uh, the security team, with the legal team, uh, does the other teams understand the message of open source, how those teams see open source uh, and, how, and, and how can I, uh, I find them value and communicate all that. And all, all this will be inside the organization, but of course this certain knowledge will also happen outside. So how can we communicate with the different open source actors? What is the matter of, of integration uh, that um, serves the organization that connects the organization and the open source actors into different ways? And um, I also wanted to point out, and I'm very involved in Chaos community, so that's why I share a lot of <laughs> what I've learned from Chaos. Uh, one of the discussions uh, we share uh, regarding this shared knowledge, like how can we communicate with different teams? Um, we, we talk about that, about, well, uh, sometimes it's hard to communicate because of the language used is super different. You cannot talk the same way you talk to engineering teams and the same way you talk with marketing team because the needs are different, the uh, wording is different, uh, but data, data is a, it's a global language. So of course it's not just about focusing on data and quantitative data, it's also qualitative information is super important but it can help and we've seen uh, there was a discussion where we saw that some OSPOs are starting to include data scientist role uh, that works on data gene, open source analysis and open source data engineering so I think that's really cool. And four, look at sustainability from all angles. So remember the uh, the first slide that I share of the sustainability and the pillars. So I think that is also important to share in the organization. That is not just about, I mean, of course it's important to uh, be aligned with the organization's goals. That is super important. But also um, take care of the other two um, angles. Uh, that is the open source communities. Uh, and, uh, and, the op um, and the open source projects. So to end up with um, some takeaways. Um, so we've seen that OSPOs are responsible for representing the organization and connecting uh, the organization with the open source ecosystem. So maybe a good question to ask if you right now have the OSPO, uh, an OSPO or are part of an OSPO is, well, at this point, at this moment, does the open source actors know who to contact in my organization? Uh, also, foster self-discovery. Uh, so it's in this way I wanted to explain more. So it's more op um, access open source to identify the the areas where there are problems and the different teams and use open source and let the OSPO P 
people to work on those problems to find solutions. So we were, I remember uh, Nithya were talking about the, like OSPO sometimes are considered cost centers um, and uh, really focus more on um, an added value. Uh, I've seen also that kind of discussion, like for instance, the, the recent layoffs that has been happening in organizations and OSPOs. Uh, I've seen, uh, of course, we cannot drive into conclusions with that, like I cannot say this is because of that, but uh, from past conversations what I've seen is that there are sometimes OSPOs are seen as an added value of the organization. And when there are uh, restrictions and uh, we are in a, there is a recession period, all these added values are the first thing that goes out. So why not start in thinking on OSPOs as a support, uh, a life, like a, actually a team or a group of people that actually supports and gives support uh, to the different teams. So uh, just something to, to think about. And uh, finally, remember about desired knowledge. Don't act as a silo, but find ways to communicate and transmit the value of open source and speak the language um, uh, on the different teams to teach them that open source is important, uh, not only for using, but also to contribute to open source. And, uh, we, we are done, but I also wanted to reserve some time to uh, introduce myself. I'm Ana Jimenez, I'm OSPO Program Manager at Twitter Group. Previously, I was in a company called Viterja, uh, that is a software development analytics firm. Uh, and in there is where I got in con a lot of in contact with all the OSPOs and also um, with organizations doing inner source uh, in, the say, in the part of the metrics and analytics. Right now, um, I'm in the tutor group. I fi uh, finished my master's in data science a few years ago now. And uh, apart from to do, I'm also involved in other open source communities such as Chaos, uh, Open Chain, Devrel Collective, or Inner Source Commons. And there is my Mastodon account in case you want to follow me and connect. And that's all. Um, I don't know if we have time for Q&A. Yep, so if um, Q&A or open discussion, uh, feel free to, to share your thoughts. Uh, I would love to, to know like, what do you think on, on open source sustainability? What do you think on the role of OSPOS there? Uh, based on your personal experience or what you have heard from other people? Uh, so yeah, uh, yes? So I have a, a question. Mm. A lot of organizations seem to think uh, we'll establish an OSPO and once the organization is mature enough, then we don't need the OSPO anymore and we'll dissolve it again. Mm -hmm. And I completely disagree and I imagine you would also, uh, but then they ask, okay, but what is an OSPO going to do in 10 years from now? The organization knows everything about open source, what are the tasks of the OSPO in 10 years? Yeah. Do you have any thoughts on that? Yeah, that, that is indeed a really interesting question. Um, I think since OSPO, it's a dynamic environment, the statement that usually make on, well, o open source, we, we reach to a maturity level and then uh, open source is not going to change. I think that is not completely right since like open source is going to be evolving uh, from one year to the other year, even in between months. Um, so, assuming, making that as assumption that, yeah, that's on and that's all, um, I, I don't think that's right. And I think it's important that organizations understand that, that open source is a dynamic environment. And if you see the OSPO as this support uh, team that helps the different teams to navigate uh, open source politics and open open source um, processes and um, and trends and advice on that. Uh, you should need it in in the long term, and I would say like 
win forever. Like you, you don't get rid of an engineering team, so you shouldn't get rid of an OSPO. Any other questions or comments? Yeah. I was just going to say that, that almost goes back to the previous session where we were talking about how OSPOs, I think, need to continually show their value, right, to leadership. It, it's hard to do, but uh, I think it's pretty super important, you know, just to not, so people don't think that, well, job done, good job, everyone, you know. Yeah, you're right. The process of a project that ends. Yeah. Once you figure out how to pay for things in your company, you don't get rid of your finance department. I would love that, actually. <laughs> <laughs> Any other questions? Okay. Yeah, okay, so uh, thank you so much for seeing us in the end.